Hi, good morning, everybody. Morning. How are you today? My name is Akshay Gupta. I'm with the Corning Grill Glass brand. I want to thank all of you very much for being here today. I know some of you have come from very far away, so we're really excited to have you here. And before we get started, a couple of things. Number one, I'd really request that you put your phones on silent. As you can see, we're very intimately seated. So that would be a great, a great thing to do. Secondly, a quick overview on what your morning and afternoon is going to look like. We're going to start with a keynote address from our Vice President General Manager, John Bain. And it will be followed by the technology manager of, of our product and performance reliability labs, Josh Jacobs. After which, Sarah Pacquiela is going to come up and give you instructions on the series of experiences that you're going to go through. It's going to, lunch is going to be served around that time as well. And then you're going to come back here for a Q&A. And I hope by that time, when that's all done, you're as excited to hear about what, we have, what we're going to share with you today. So without further ado, John Bain, the floor is yours. Thank you, Akshay. Good morning, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us here today. So we're here to talk about the digital era. It's amazing to think about the technology behind the devices today that surround us in our daily life. So much complexity, so much technology. But the interesting thing is, if you look at the interface of IT and the smartphone today, it's so simplistic. We can look at our phone and see who's standing at our front door. We can turn the lights in our house or apartment off. We can turn appliances on. We can pay our kids college tuition, or our own for that matter. We can FaceTime with people and video chat. We can even sit at our desk and watch a World Cup soccer game when we're supposed to be working. Not that any of us have done that in the last couple weeks. <laughs> so it's really an incredible time to be alive in terms of technology. Now, if Generation Z or some of our kids take this technology for granted, who's to blame them? This is the world they've grown up in. This is the world they know. But for those of us who are a little bit more experienced, it's hard not to be blown away with the amount of technology at our fingertips. I'd like to reference a work today, a recent book by Matt LaMerrill and Allison Davis. They wrote a book called Corporate Innovation in the Fifth Era. And their assertion was that human development can be bucketed into five distinct eras or categories. And each one of these eras was marked by significant innovation and technology disruption that changed the way people interact on a personal basis and how societies interacted. The first era was the hunter-gatherer era. Now, clearly, this has the coolest name, but not the one I would choose to live in since average life expectancy was about 25 years. That era started about 2 million years ago and ended about 12,000 years ago. Then we have the agrarian era. We would domesticated animals and started to plant crops. This is where the first human networks began to form, and people interacted on a very small local and regional level. Then we go to the mercantile era. For this era, we had trade and commerce expanding across boundaries, and now those human interactions were occurring across states and across regions. Then the industrial era, which we're so familiar with from high school, where trade and commerce starts to explode, but the networks start to evolve in real time with newspapers, telegraph, telephony, and then at the end of this era, the internet shows up. And then here we sit on the eve of the digital era. Now it's very interesting, the earlier eras lasted for thousands of years and the industrial era for a couple hundred years. We're about 30 or 35 years into the digital era. So there's much more to be written in this story in the digital era. Now, what are the key components of the digital era. You have hyper-collaboration, hyper-adoption, and hyper-innovation. You don't have to be really good at pattern recognition to see the word hyper in all three of these components. And why is hyper there? Because everything is so fast. The clock speed of the ecosystem we're in now is so quick, and these innovations are just building on each other and complementing each other. And we're in a period of exponential growth. Now, Something very interesting. Humans are wired for linear growth. 
not exponential growth. Let me give you an example. We had a consultant in last week at Corning who recently wrote a book with a partner. The book was Detonate, and his name was Jeffrey Tuff, and he used this example, and I thought it was great. If I were to tell you I was going to take 30 steps across this room and ask you where I would end up, 30 linear steps, we would all get to about the same spot, plus or minus a few feet. If I then said I was going to take exponential steps, so I was going to double each successive step, start with a three-foot step, and then six, 12, and 24, and do that 30 times, where would I end up? In this exercise last week, we had people say a couple miles. I said you'd end up in Boston from Corning. Other people said you'd end up in California. The answer, you would circle the globe 26 times. And I said, that can't be true. And then I did the math, and it was right, 26 times. Why do I say this? It's so hard to predict exponential growth, but the answer has to be innovate more, not innovate less. It's hard enough innovating in a linear world. In an exponential world, you absolutely have to innovate. And that's what we've seen smartphones do, and that's what Corning does to support the industry. So behind the smartphone and the IT technology and, and the internet is all sorts of technology as I referenced. You have mainframe computers, server computers, laptops, tablets, data centers, optical fiber, which Corning helped to develop 40 years ago. But one could argue at the heart of today's digital era, our digital life is enabled by the smartphone. Not only do we create the content the pictures, the videos you're taking right now, the tweets, the emails, the texts, the blogs, but also this is our portal to extract information from the internet. The smartphone is enabling the digital era. So let's take a quick look at how the smartphone evolved. Starts around 1996, we have flip phones. Global population approaching six billion people, 145 million lucky people have cellular subscriptions. And they're using their phone to call, and text is the latest innovation that is so cool on a flip phone. And the most important number, global internet traffic is being consumed at 0.027 gigabits per second. 0.027. Fast forward to 2002. Subscribers are over a billion, we're on 3G networks, and already we're seeing that exponential growth Internet traffic, 100 gigabits per second. Then the smartphone shows up in 2007, and this is where Corning enters the scene by enabling the first smartphones, which were touch-enabled with our glass. Now we have over 3 billion global subscribers, and that number that started at 0.027 is now 2,000 gigabits per second, once again demonstrating exponential growth. 2011, we're on a 4G network. The concept of apps start to show up, 650,000 apps, 12,000 gigabits per second, and now we're seeing mobile ad spending in excess of $3 billion. 2016, now we're at 5 million apps, 26,000 gigabits per second, mobile ad spending exploding. And then here we sit today looking at a woman with her two children who have known no other universe than the one we're in with technology, 7 billion people with cellular subscriptions, seven million apps available today, seven million apps. 100,000 gigabits per second of data, global, global internet traffic. And if you think we're done here, not by a long shot. And what's amazing is once the smartphone showed up, the thing that people were interacting with to access those seven million apps, touching on their phone, glass developed by Corning and glass made by Corning. That's an incredible, meaningful way to make a living, knowing that you're enabling the digital life and smartphones. And here's a very interesting point. I love this point. On the hyper-adoption slide I showed earlier, there was a stat that said 100 years for the world to embrace telephony in all developing regions. It took 20 years to get there for the internet, so five times faster. But now look at what we're seeing. For mobile payments, streaming, phone reliance, Developing regions have leapfrogged the developed markets. Mobile payments, 32% of people in developing regions use their phone for mobile payments, 11% in developed regions. So one could ask, who's developed and who's developing now? Right? The developing region is leading in some of these digital life 
type categories. Really, really interesting. So another question, I told you that the thing we're interacting with, we've sold um, glass that has gone on to six billion devices since we launched uh, our initial Gorilla Glass in 2007. Obvious question, why is glass such a great material to protect a smartphone? Short answer, it's got incredible properties. Let's review these. Number one, if something is incredibly important to you, like your smartphone or your tablet, and you want to protect it, you want something that's somewhat chemically stable. If you take a one millimeter piece of plastic, an oxygen molecule can work its way through that plastic in two weeks. One millimeter of glass, five trillion years. You're not going to wait that one out. So it's very chemically stable. Number two, you want to be able to form it to precision dimensions. We've used our fusion forming process, which we de de uh, developed for the display industry, to make our Gorilla Glass. We can get incredibly tight tolerances, sheet shapes, sizes, and thicknesses using this process. Number three, you want something incredibly pure because you're looking through it. And if it's doing its job, you don't want to see the cover glass. You want to see the display underneath it. Our, one of our purest forms of glass is used for optical fiber. If you took that glass and filled the Indian Ocean, which on average is three miles deep, you could see the bottom of the Indian Ocean through that glass. That's how pure you can make glass. Then you want clarity. We can do things to Gorilla Glass in terms of composite materials that offer very low reflection, low haze, low glare surfaces. Glass is a dielectric. Why is this important? Doesn't conduct electricity. If you want to go to wireless charging, this is a good property to have. Glass can also be made incredibly thin. The earliest smartphones used glass about 1.1 millimeters thick. Now today you see uh, thicknesses 0 0.4, 0 0.5, 0 0.6 millimeter are very common. And finally, glass can be made flexible. If at some point in the future you want to go with a foldable display or a flexible display, glass can flex to very tight radii. So all these properties are why glass has been the dominant material for cover uh, to protect smartphones as a cover device. Now, very interesting. There's people out there who say, well, we're going to voice control and we have Siri and Alexa, so do we really need to touch our phones going forward? We looked at a study that was recently published. People on average touch their phones 2,000 times a day. This was another data point when I first saw it. I said, no, that can't be true. But then think about it. If you send five tweets by the old rules, that was 700 times touching the phone. With the new rules, you're over 1,000. You're halfway there with five tweets. Then if you text like I do and have to retype every text two or three times, email, social media, reading the paper, you can easily get to 2,000 times a day. So I don't think we're quite at the point where people are not going to be touching their devices in the near future. In addition, not only touching, but being on their devices two plus hours a day. Once again, a worldwide average. I'm sure we can find people on it much more than that. Now, as good as our glass is, it has to get better. Why? Because the phones are getting better. I talked about hyper-innovation. The smartphone industry, as we saw in 22 short years, 22 years, went from the flip phone to the phones we're using today, which are incredibly compelling designs, incredibly innovative, and we're not done yet. Just since 2011, devices have gotten thinner, from 12 millimeters to 7 millimeters. They've gotten bigger. Here, 88.9 screen size to 139 millimeters. They've gone from 2D designs to 2.5D designs and 3D designs. The glass is proud, which means it sits up higher over the display, and we're seeing glass in the back now to enable wireless charging and 5G networks, which is on the future. All of these things require the glass to perform at a higher level, requires Corning to keep innovating constantly. We're always innovating. We're always tough. But the question is, where do you focus your innovation? Once again, we ask our consumers, the end market, what's the most important thing to you? And year after year, it comes back, we want our phones to be damage resistant when they drop. Yes, we want scratch resistance. Yes, we want readability and sunlight. But drop is still the number one pain point. 
So this is what we focused on with the Gorilla Glass 5 two years ago. This is what we're continuing to focus on. Once again, we looked at the market. How many times are people dropping their phones? Because in the past, we've tried to see how high we can go with our glasses to prevent a, a break in our lab tests. People on average are dropping their phones seven times a year globally, seven times a year. And the majority of those are occurring at one meter. And here we asked people, surveyed, what percent of people had dropped their phones at a meter versus 1.6 meter? And the majority are occurring at one meter and below. So yes, we want glasses that drop at higher heights, but we wanted to attack this problem of repeated drops. And that's exactly what we did with Gorilla Glass 6. So I'm very excited today to announce the world's most advanced glass available, Gorilla Glass 6. Once again, the most technically advanced glass available in the world today for smartphones and tablets. This glass was engineered specifically to be tough for repeated drops. Not only does it drop higher than Gorilla Glass 5, which was our best-selling, most advanced product, but we specifically engineered this glass for survivability of repeated drops. In our lab tests from one meter, Gorilla Glass 6 survived on average 15 drops from a meter. That's twice the rate of Gorilla Glass 5 and most competitor glasses broke after the first drop. Corning invented this category in 2007. We've been the market leader ever since. We continue to innovate. We have to innovate in glass. Why? Because there are still phones out there that break. The designs are more compelling. The phones are more flexible. The glass is thinner. If we use Gorilla Glass 5 or Gorilla Glass 6 on the earliest designs, drop would not be that much of a problem but the phones are that much more demanding of the glass, which is why we have to keep innovating. So that's what we've done with Gorilla Glass 6. Always tough, always innovating. And this is our way of contributing to the digital life in the digital era. Now I'd like to turn it over to Josh Jacobs. He's one of the technologists who actually developed this glass, and he's gonna take you through the science behind the glass. Thank you. Thank you, John. All right, good morning, and welcome all to Sunnyvale. My name is Josh Jacobs. I'm a technology manager in Gorilla um, Development Organization, and very happy to be here today to talk to you about this new product offering, Corning Gorilla Glass 6. John has done a great job setting up the environment around which we innovated this new glass, and what I'd like to do now is really take you a little bit more deeply through the technology surrounding the innovation talk about how we innovated this new generation of glass, and talk most importantly about the performance that this glass can offer the next generation of devices. I think it wouldn't be a surprise to anybody in the audience to understand that glass has really been chosen as the material of choice for these mobile consumer electronics applications. And the reason for that, as John mentioned, is really the functionality of glass. It offers amazing properties in terms of things like scratch resistance versus plastic materials, it offers things like touch sensitivity that's needed for interacting thousands of times with these devices per day. And it offers things like the optical clarity needed for the high quality displays on these devices that are in the market today. So it's really been driven by this functionality, but glass also conveys a certain quality, a certain precision, and that's part of the reason as well that glass has been so highly adopted in this, this application. So Corning, again, has been very proud to be a innovating partner in terms of this environment. And as John mentioned, we have over 6 billion devices, 6 billion in the field today with Corning Girl Glass as a cover material. One of the things that I find most interesting is really the interplay between device design and glass durability. And what I mean by that is as we've made glasses which are more and more durable, we find that people have taken advantage of that in two ways. And one of those is people, of course, have made the devices more durable, but the other, as John mentioned, is that they've evolved the design over time to make the, the uh, devices more aesthetically pleasing, make them sleeker, thinner, larger form factors. And it's really this almost a symbiotic relationship between the glass design and the device design. If you look at devices on the left side of the screen from, say, a decade ago, seven years ago, 
you found that most of the designs were flat. The glass was just a, a flat, planar piece of glass. It was often hidden behind a large metallic bezel or plastic bezel. And so what would happen is when you actually would drop this device on something like asphalt, something like concrete, you would find that in many cases it wasn't actually the glass that was making the first contact with that surface. It was the metallic or perhaps the plastic bezel. Fast forward to today, and what you find, as John mentioned, is that you have much different designs. You have 2.5D glass, where people have machined the edges of the glass to take on a shape. You have 3D formed glasses, where people have actually formed the entire sheet of glass in a hot method to take on a, a curved appearance. And as John mentioned, we've also seen the advent, the adoption of glass backs. And again, that's not just aesthetic. It's for things like wireless charging. It's for things like RF transmission so that designers have the flexibility to place antennas wherever they wish within the rear of that device. So glass, again, really because of its properties, enabling these design changes throughout the years. What that comes down to is that with this evolution, the performance of glass has become more critical than ever. Things like damage resistance, things like drop performance, things like the um, retained strength of the glass are more critical than ever and this is really the backdrop against which we started inventing Gorilla Glass 6. So again, very happy today to announce for the first time the release of Corning Gorilla Glass 6, offering best-in-class damage resistance for survivability in these repeated drops that we're so concerned about given the consumer input that we have. If I back up a little bit to the technology behind the glass, one of the things that I think is really interesting within Corning is the time and the effort and the dedication that we've taken in really understanding deeply why glass fails in the field. What you can see on the left is basically a chart of how we've categorized failure in the field. To the layperson who has a device, it's very black and white. They drop a device on the asphalt, on the concrete, and the glass may be broken or the glass may survive. What we do is we take that a couple steps deeper. We rely on our material scientist, we rely on our failure analyst, and what we do is we actually categorize those failures based on understanding of the failure mechanism or the failure mode that we see. And what we find most importantly is that about 80% of the cases of glass breakage in the field is actually due to what we call damage introduction. So this would be glasses hitting something like a sharp asphalt surface, something like a sharp concrete surface, and actually introducing damage into the glass, which then propagates to failure. What we find, however, is that that's not enough to have that damage in the glass. We also have to have stress, which is applied during that drop event. And so what you would find if you were able to look at a, a slow motion video or look at a freeze frame of a device dropping is you would actually find, as you see on the right of the slide, that the device is actually bending and applying stress to that damage which is created. So it's really this combination of damage introduction and applied stress, and those are really the two ingredients that we're trying to innovate around as we think about next generation glasses, such as Gorilla Glass 6. So what have, we, what have we done to enhance this new glass composition? What we've done is we've really started from the ground up. We have a new composition, we have new processing, and we have new chemical strengthening ion exchange to really enable a higher capacity for a, a more beneficial layer of armor, as I would call it, within the glass structure. So if you look on the left side of the slide here, what you see is a glass which may be non-optimized. We have damage again being introduced during a drop event, and we have a case on the left where that damage is not fully enveloped within this layer of compression in the glass. And in this case, compression acts to retain strength in that material. What we've done with Girl Glass 6 is we've modified again the capacity to accept this compression. We have a higher compression not only on the surface, but also within the bulk of the material. And what this means is that when we have these drop events and we have these stress events, we have a higher probability of survival during these repeated drops that John mentioned is so important from a consumer standpoint. Before I get into data, which of course as a scientist is my, my favorite part of the presentation, I wanna talk a little bit about how we tested Gorilla Glass 6. What we've done and what we explained a couple years ago is that we tend to use a proxy, a 180 grit sandpaper surface as a substitute for some of the real materials that we see in the field. Things like asphalts, things like concretes, things like natural stone materials. And the reason we do that is when we do testing, we have two key things in mind. 
we want to make sure that the testing is relevant to what's happening in the field, and we want to make sure that the testing is repeatable and that it's reproducible in the laboratory. What we find if we actually test on things like granites, asphalts, concretes, is that that surface actually changes over time as those materials wear. And so what we've done is we've basically substituted 180 grit sandpaper as a surface which gives us the same failure mode as what we see in the field. So again, on the left of the slide, what we have here is a drop failure from our 180 grit sandpaper. What we have on the right is a drop failure actually in the field on an asphalt material. And you can see that those breaks look very, very similar. But what we've done again is we've done the science behind that. We've gone a couple level or levels deeper in the analysis and we find that the details of failure are also very, very similar. So we have the same damage event, we have the same severity of damage, we have the same stress that's being applied. So we feel very confident that this is a good surrogate for our testing. But having said that, I also talked about the evolution of device design over time, moving to these new two and a half and 3D form factors and moving to more aggressive surface. And so what we've done and what you'll see in the data is we've tested in a couple different manners. We've done 2D drop testing. So these are pucks meant to represent a 2D design. And we've dropped them, as John mentioned, repeated times from one meter height onto this 180 grit surface. And the reason we've done, again, that repeated drop testing is seeing to what level, to what number of drops can that glass survive because that's so important to our use in the field. What we've done beyond that, however, is we've looked at 3D designs. And so we've actually developed new test methods and new vehicles which represent more modern 3D designs. We've tested those in a manner not only flat on the face, but we've tested those in a manner where now we're testing different orientations as we drop on that surface. And we've done that in a manner where we start at low heights and then we increment to higher heights. Beyond that, we've also looked at even more aggressive surface. And so we continue to believe, and the data on the slide shows, that 180 grit sandpaper remains a great substitute for the most common materials that we see in the field, things like asphalts, et cetera. But what we've done is we've actually extended our testing to a more aggressive 120 grit sandpaper, which represents the even more extreme end of what might happen in the field. These may not be the common everyday materials. These may be things like rough concretes, but again, we wanted to expand the test set around how we've tested our, our new glass composition. So getting into the data. So as John said, Gorilla 6 improves survivability in these everyday drop events. What I'm showing here on the slide is dropping from one meter, repeated drops. This is our 2D puck in a flat orientation. And what we see is substantial improvement in things like damage resistance and retained strength. Gorilla Glass 6 in this testing has survived 15, 15 drops on average, where you see on the left side of the slide that the alternative aluminosilicate glass is failing on average on the first drop. So substantial improvement in this laboratory testing of our Gorilla 6 versus the alternative aluminosilicate glasses. The other thing that we see is Gorilla 5, as we expect, has a substantial advantage versus those competitive aluminosilicate glasses, but not quite the performance of Gorilla Glass 6. In that case, it's surviving to a lesser number of average drops. Only about 33% of those are going to 20 drops with survival. Where on the other hand, with Gorilla 6, we've actually seen almost three quarters, 73%, of those samples that we test are going all the way to 20 drops without failure. So just substantial improvement in terms of things like retained strength and damage resistance of the glass. If we take that same test and we move to an even harsher surface, in this case, the 120 grit sandpaper representing things like rough concretes, we see a very similar story. If you look at the left of the slide, you see again, alternative aluminosilicate glass failing again on the first drop in this testing. Gorilla 5 now survives a handful of drops in this more aggressive condition, and a small percentage of that surviving to 20 drops. And now again, we have Gorilla 6 in this test surviving a large number of drops, two times the number of drops that Gorilla 5 has survived. And we see in this case, almost 50% of those surviving to 20 drops. So again, a testament to the innovation of this new material and the ability to survive this increasing number of drops with that new material. And finally, if we go even to some of these new designs, this is now data from 3D testing. So we've taken a 3D vehicle. We've tested this again, not only in flat drops, but we've tested this in multiple orientations to get a better sense of what might happen in the field. And in this case, we see a very similar advantage. In this case, a 1.4 times improvement versus Gorilla Glass 5, again, showcasing that improved damage resistance 
and retain strength of the material. So that's a lot of talk about drop, which as John said, is really the key thing that consumers tell us that they're concerned about with these mobile electronics applications. But having said that, as we develop these new glasses, we wanna make sure that we're not degrading other attributes. And one of those that's very important is things like scratch performance. So we of course have also tested scratch for Gorilla 6 and happy to claim that it is equivalent to previous generations, including Gorilla Glass 5. What we have here, and you'll see some of this in the laboratory demos today, is we do a couple different tests to look at scratch performance. And on the upper left, you see one of our tests. This is called the purse tumble test. And what we're doing in this test is basically tumbling our glass materials with, me with uh, media that you would find every day in your pocket or perhaps in your purse. So these are things like coins, keys, cosmetics, et cetera. And so this is really a very realistic test that simulates what can happen in the field. And what you can see on the top row on the left is that if we look at alternative glasses like alternative soda lime, you see we have much more prominent and much more visible damage on that material versus Gorilla 5 and 6 and those latter materials having the same performance. If we actually quantify this, we see in that case that we have about two times the amount of damage on the alternative soda lime as we do on our Gorilla family materials. We also have some other testing. We do some linear abrasion testing, which is a very controlled abrasion. We do that with different materials. And we find again, as you can see in the images, that we have a much more visible and much more severe damage on the alternative material than we do on Gorilla 5 and Gorilla 6. So again, our mission as we develop this new material is really to first and foremost, enhance the drop performance and make sure that we can survive these repeated drops on rough surface. But we wanna make sure when we do that, that we're not degrading other attributes and happy to say that we've achieved that with Gorilla 6. So in summary, again, very happy today to introduce Corn and Gorilla Glass 6. This is a material which offers a substantial improvement in retained strength, drop performance. And so seeing again, up to a 2X improvement in drop survivability on these rough surfaces. As a reminder, the alternative aluminosilicate material in that case is failing in our testing on the first drop and surviving 15 drops on the rough surface in that testing. So again, just a, a phenomenal performance and something again, we're very proud to announce today. So with that, thank you very much again for coming to Sunnyvale. Thank you for your attention. Gorilla Glass 6 is in production now and I will turn it over to Ms. Sarah Pacchiella to take you through the rest of the day. Thank you.